Hello, I'm Stefan Schwartz, and it's my pleasure to welcome you back to Schwartz Report. A number of you have contacted me asking me, how can I become an agent of change fostering well-being? I mean, you put it in a number of different ways, but that's the question. How do I do that? So today's podcast, I'm going to focus on how you can do that. And I want to stress that everything that I'm telling you can be, uh, is and can be checked and is based uh, on scientific research. I, as I have said before, this is not about speculation or philosophy. This is about objectively verifiable research. And the answer to the question of how do you become an agent of change is based on this reality. Culture is created by individual choices and attitudes. That's why the Italians cook eggplants different than the Japanese who cook them differently than the Indians. Culture is an accumulative, consensual perspective that develops in each culture. So the critical part is the individual. That's what makes it work. So if you want to become an agent of change and foster well-being, there are basically two things that you can do that will make you a powerful agent. The first is meditation, and the second is the quotidian choice. So let me start with meditation. Most people, at least in Western cultures, think of meditation as being some sort of belief of Asian religions. But in fact, meditation doesn't have anything to do with religion other than that religions all empirically develop the practice of meditation because they come to recognize that this is a way you get in touch with the non-local aspect of your consciousness. It also produces enormous physical changes. If you go to PubMed, the National Institutes of Library database, and you search on the word meditation, you will find almost 10,000 citations that come up. These are papers that have been published in peer-reviewed journals. So there's an enormous amount of research on meditation. And when you look at that research, what you discover is that developing the daily practice of meditation is, in my opinion, and supported by the research, is the best gift you're ever going to give yourself. It's really quite extraordinary. The research shows that people who regularly practice the meditation, to a meditation technique, and there are many techniques, I'm going to talk about one, but there are many. The key is that you develop the daily practice. The people who practice meditation completely rewire their brains. They also lower their stress level. They improve their well-being, their general health. They improve their concentration, their creativity. I mean, it just goes on and on. There really is nothing else that you can do that's quite like the daily practice of meditation. In addition to changing yourself, it also changes people around you because you change. You reprogram yourself. You rewire yourself. And other research, not meditation research, but research, for instance, about happiness, shows that when you become happier, all the people around you become happier friends become happier. Studies show that if you are happier and you report that you're feeling better, that people within several miles of you who have even just limited contact with you will also feel happier, will feel less stress. So developing the daily practice of meditation, however you do it, is one of the best gifts you can give yourself, I think the best gift, and it also makes you an agent 
just by the change in yourself of well-being and happiness for people in your family, your friends, your neighbors. It's really astonishing when you look at the research, quite extraordinary. So I'm going to give you one meditation technique that is based entirely on science. As I said, most people associate meditation with religion, but that's because religions doing basically a kind of empirical observational science over centuries have learned that this ability to open to the non-local aspect of yourself, that is, there is an aspect of your consciousness that existed prior to your incarnation and that will continue after your physical death. We are each capable of opening to this non-local aspect of consciousness. This is where creativity comes from. This is where spiritual epiphanies come from. This is where artistic creation comes from. The interesting thing is if you look at the uh, commentary that's provided by scientists or musicians or painters or writers or people who we think of as spiritual pilgrims or people who are doing something like remote viewing, they all report the same experience of opening to an aspect of their consciousness of which they were formerly unaware. And this aspect is the part of you which is outside of space-time. So, developing meditation. Here is a way to do it. As I said, it's normally associated with religion, but it's not about any specific religion. It's about a practice, and the key to it is the ability to attain and sustain intentioned, focused awareness. And when you do that regularly, as I said, you reprogram yourself, you rewire your brain, you change your health, all kinds of benefits accrue from this. So here you go. Here's a way of meditating that is offensive to no religion and, uh, and yet involves no religion. You choose a regular time. You select a time each day where you can sit for 20 minutes without being interrupted. You turn off the phone. You tell people you're going to do this or, or you arrange to be left alone. What you want is 20 minutes of uninterrupted silence. No television, no phone, nothing, no radios, none of it. Now, the thing that you'll discover when you set up this time is that it suddenly becomes the busiest time of the day. But you persevere and you create this silent space that you create for yourself for 20 minutes. You select a spot somewhere in your house or your office that you can do your meditation in. It's creating a sacred space for yourself. I had a very good friend who, who meditated in her closet because she could close the door of her closet and sit there in silence and nobody would bother her. So you want to pick this space that you're going to use every day you're building up a ritual, and that is a way of programming yourself to do this reprogramming process. You pick a central phrase, some phrase or sentence, something that you've heard or read that has deeply impressed you and, or with which you resonate or wish to align yourself. It, it could be something out of the Bible. It could be a poem from a, a favorite poem or a favorite book, or it could be a verse from a song. It should be something that has a strong, positive association in your mind, whether or not it would make sense to another person. That isn't the point. 
is is a central phrase that you could use. You could say, for instance, be still and know that all is one, or uh, be still and open to the, the higher aspect of myself. Or you could use a mantra if you were inclined that way, or a, as I say, a biblical phrase. It's a central phrase that represents something strongly positive in your mind. You keep your phrase a secret, by the way. You don't tell anybody. Because if you tell anybody and they start talking about it, when you sit down and you say your phrase, you may hear their voice. And you don't want to do that. So you don't want their attitude. You don't want their statement. You keep this to yourself. This is a private aspect of yourself. You examine your life, consider where you are, consider what you aspire to be. Consider this from the physical, the emotional, the mental, and the spiritual. Look for patterns. And considering the physical, let's say you overeat, and it's been a lifelong problem. It's a negative. So the positive would be you wish to eat consciously and healthfully and in appropriate amounts. So you pick these four phrases that come to you, a physical phrase, an emotional phrase, a mental phrase, a spiritual phrase. You get your four words of intentioned purpose. And each of these words should represent a situation you find yourself in or that you about yourself and something you aspire to. So as I said in the earlier uh, example I gave, you might choose the word food. I presently don't eat correctly. I eat uh, fast foods. They're not helping my health. I wish I could eat uh, properly and healthfully. So your word might be food. An emotional word might be, uh, you might feel that people disregard your feelings or that when people don't behave the way you want them to, you feel very angry. So the positive of this might be feelings that are positive, and you choose to be only involved with people who acknowledge a potential, a potential positive orientation. So your word might be feelings. And... I make a difference between the emotional and the mental because I have discovered over the years that when you ask people, well, what do you think about that? They'll say, I feel. Or you ask them, how do you feel about that? And they'll say, I think. So we confuse the emotional with the mental. So you pick a mental word and the mental word might be, I feel confused a lot or I, I just... I just don't seem to be able to get things sorted out properly. And I wish I could do that. So your word might be clarity. But in any case, you, you, you take these four words. These are going to be your words of power. You establish your daily practice once a day at the same time. You go to your chosen place at your chosen time. You're present to meditate for 20 minutes. You can sit in a comfortable position. You loosen collars, belts, shoelaces, anything that constricts so that you're in a comfortable position. You look at your watch and your clock, and you visualize the hands of your watch or your clock as they will be in 20 minutes so that you give yourself the suggestion, um, I will meditate for 20 minutes. And this, by the way, I haven't used, I, I'm a 60 year meditator using this technique. I created this technique after reading all of the scientific research that I could find on the subject, as opposed to, as well as uh, many of the religious beliefs. But I, I came to realize, as I said, that Meditation is something independent of any specific religion, and it is not tied 
to any particular religion. It is about opening to this aspect of yourself, this non-local aspect, which is the source of your creativity, the source of your clear thinking, that sort of thing. So what it will also do, as I said, I've been doing this for 60 years. I know I haven't had an alarm clock in decades because when I go to bed at night, I look at my watch and I picture what it will look like eight hours into the future. And I'd say, I'm going to sleep for eight hours. I focus on that. And in fact, I wake up in eight hours. So there you are. You're sitting. You're in your position. You're in your place. You set up the time. You say your central phrase. You repeat it several times. You say it again. You say it again. For a while, there'll be nothing. But then thoughts will bubble up. If the thoughts pertain to your phrase, whether anyone else would think they do or not, doesn't matter. You're not going to tell anybody else. You think them. And if they don't, then you say your phrase again. After a while, you'll find that your thoughts focus in. The key to this whole thing is the ability to attain and sustain intentioned focused awareness. So after a while, if you do this, your phrase or a particular word of power may go flat. And when you look at it, you, you'll understand it just doesn't seem to have the same resilient resonance that it had before. And you'll look at your life and you'll realize, oh my goodness, I am now what I had aspired to be. So you literally can reprogram yourself using this. And as you change your character, as I said earlier, everybody around you changes to accommodate that, to deal with that. And so you sit in silence. And at the end of your 20 minutes, you say your phrases, your, your special words of power. You can see them arcing out or however you visualize it. So you've been sitting there in silence for 20 minutes and you close by saying your words of power. And as I say, after a while, they go flat. And then you find out I have become the person that I had hoped to be. And you will also discover not only that your thinking has changed, you're clearer, your memory is doing better, but that uh, you're physically healthier. And so this simple technique of spending these 20 minutes every day, developing this practice as a discipline, will make you and prepare you to be an agent of change. You will be a different person. The second part of becoming an agent of change is the quotidian choice. Every day, we make dozens of choices. The toothpaste we buy, the toilet paper we buy, the cat food or dog food we buy, all of these things, each of them represents a vote that either fosters well-being or degrades it. And so to develop the quotidian choice, what you need to do is research. You have to do a little digging. It's not complicated. To look and see which of the companies that make or produce or whatever, whatever it is you want to buy, are the, com are the companies that foster well-being. Now, I've begun to notice that corporations are beginning to get aware of this. If you look at a Subaru commercial, for instance, you, you, you will hear that Subaru as a corporation has now begun to find and identify and fund all kinds of foundations and, and uh, social work that fosters well-being. And you do this with all kinds of all the companies that you buy 
because every purchase is a vote. And as you do this, you tell people what you're doing. You tell them that you are making a commitment to become an agent of change, that you are practicing the, both meditation and the quotidian choice. So, quotidian just means, by the way, ordinary, mundane, pedestrian, just little stuff that you choose. You don't even normally give much thought to it. Uh, you just do it because that's what you do. Only this time you become aware of it, you become conscious, and you only buy those things or deal with those businesses or donate to those charities, whatever, when you have done some research on them and you discover that they foster well-being. You always pick of the choices available to you at any moment, you pick the one that is the most compassionate, the most life-affirming, the most fostering of well-being. You tell people that you are doing it and you invite them to join you. You tell 10 of your friends you're doing it and you invite them to do it and to tell 10 of their friends. And in that way, you can change the course of history. Now, am I making this up? Am I exaggerating? I am not. This is how Gandhi got independence for India without a war. Before he was assassinated, a reporter from the Times of India came up to interview Gandhi at his ashram. And the reporter said, my uh, editor has sent me up here to ask you one question. How did you force the British to give India independence? How did you do this? You had no money. You had no official position. You had no military. How did you do this? Force this country, one of the most powerful in the world, to give up its most prized colonial possession. And Gandhi's answer illustrates what I am talking about. He said, it's not what we did that mattered, although that mattered. It's not what we said that mattered, although that mattered. It was the nature of our character, what I would call our beingness, that led the British to choose to leave India. And this, by the way, is what informed Nelson Mandela and how he ended apartheid in South Africa. This is how Martin Luther King began the civil rights movement. It is nonviolent. It is done by ordinary people. It doesn't require a military. It doesn't require official position. It doesn't require a lot of money. All it requires is that you make the commitment to first alter yourself and then to express that alteration by all of the choices you make and that they are all compassionate, life-affirming, and fostering of well-being. And you think about this. You have the power to change the culture. And we know from research done at Van Rensselaer Polytech Institute, who studied this issue, that when 10% of any cohort, whether it's a church group, a school group, a neighborhood group, or a nation, when 10% of the cohort changes in consciousness, the rest of the cohort, whatever its size, must also change in order to accommodate for the change of the 10%. So 10% changing changes everything. And you can see examples of this. When I was a boy and I went to somebody's house they had on their ta coffee table in their living room an ashtray and a pack of cigarettes and a lighter. You never see that anymore. Why? Nobody passed a law that said you can't do it. The president didn't go on television and tell people to quit, quit doing it. What happened? And the answer is individuals became aware that their well-being would be improved if they didn't smoke. And so they individually made a choice. And today, you never hear about it. When was the last time you heard the word Negro? 
You don't say that anymore. Why? Nobody outlawed it. It was just recognized as inappropriate. Because a, a, you get to a critical consensus of people, this 10% level, and when they move in that consciousness, then the whole cohort moves on that. You can see the same thing, for instance, with gay has become LGBTQ. Nobody passed a law that said you had to do that. Nobody lobbied publicly for doing that. It's that people were touched by it and made a choice to use it and to, and to use LGBTQ instead of just gay because they recognized there was a change in consciousness and that it was a larger community. So we have the power to change the culture and you personally can become an agent of change and you can help others become agents of change. And when that happens, compassionately, life-affirmingly, fostering well-being, our society will change, our democracy will be strengthened. Thank you.